Shalom and peace be with each one of you this day. We welcome you to this time of worship as we gather to remember that this is the day of the Lord. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. A very special happy Father's Day to all of the fathers who are worshiping with us, those who are in person and those who are joining us online. Uh, and we want to remember that sometimes fathers extend beyond the immediate family, and there are fathers among us who have modeled for us what it means to be loving, caring, guiding people in our midst, and we honor those fathers as well. I note that if you are uh, new with us online, we welcome you, and you may want to uh, have some food and drink for later on in communion as we worship together. In new and creative ways, we also extend the prayer concerns to outside this place to those folks who are worshiping online. If you want to send a prayer concern, Please do so by Facebook Live Chat, and that will show up for our videographer, or you can text Michaela's cell phone, uh, and if you look it up in the directory, be sure and dial the 559 area code, not 530. I think we corrected that on our recent directories, but you may have an old one. So friends, if you're at home and want to extend a prayer concern, please send uh, it our way, and we will share it with prayer time later on. Also wanted to uh, draw your attention to the announcements that are on the back of the bulletin as well as they're running behind me. Just want to highlight a couple of them. First of all, we're reserving, res resuming now post-COVID our Out to Lunch Bunch. We have started it pre-COVID, got uh, some wonderful uh, attendance and went to lunch together, fellowship with one another, and then COVID hit and we all kind of went into our pods and our seclusion. We're starting that again. We're going to lunch this Tuesday. Meet at Dawn's Sandwich Shop at 1130 on Michelli and we'll share some good food and fellowship together and just catch up with each other one-on-one. -on -one. So we hope that you will join us. There's a sign-up sheet on the back table. Put your name down so we make sure we have enough chairs set out around the tables uh, uh, beforehand. Also, there's a board meeting this Wednesday at 6 p.m. Board reports are due Tuesday morning in the office, please. Next Sunday, the crafters group starts up again with its first meeting at Diane B.'s home. All are welcome. You don't have to be particularly crafted. Uh, you don't have to have the gifts of crafting. Just come. And uh, there are lots of jobs that we begin to work on to get ready for our holiday boutique, which happens in November. It's a fun group, and we would love to have you uh, as we make some handmade items for that November holiday boutique. I think we have some other announcements. Margie or Ellis? Okay. I just want to say thank you to everybody that's volunteered to work this week at the thrift store. The thrift store schedule is full. Awesome. So thank you very much. And I'm up here to get your attention. <laughs> the thrift store is extremely important to this congregation. And last week we made over a thousand dollars. Very good. The thrift store has a long history. It grew from a yard sale, which became we did in one week what we do in a year now. Uh, it grew out of an intense, intense interest in this congregation in helping people. We have an excellent outreach program in this congregation. It's one of the best that I've ever seen. And the uh, working at the thrift store is one way that you can help. Uh, you don't have to have any money to work in the thrift store. <laughs> it's free, but it's very rewarding. And I, I really appreciate everybody that it helps out because it makes a tremendous difference, not only to the congregation, to, but people that are in need. Thank you. I would like to add something yes. to that. Yes, Lynn. You do need money to work at the thrift store. Those who work at the thrift store tend to find treasures, and they tend to buy those things, yes. So. But you don't have to. It's not required. But it is so much fun. Yes, yes. And a reminder that that money goes directly to help those in need in our community. Finally, I want to make 
make sure any who are father figures, if you have not picked up your Ziploc baggie, uh, please uh, do so because those are uh, going to come in handy during the children's moment. So this is a little gift from the kids to you to say Happy Dad's Day. And Mary, did I see your hand? Yes. I, I was listening to uh, Ella and Miss talk about the thrift store. Eight years ago, he stood up there and gave the same talk about working in the thrift store. So guess who signed up eight years ago? <laughs>
Thank you very much, Donia. Uh, will you stand as we join together in the call for worship? The God of those fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters who followed Jesus in the early years, now calls you to this time of worship, that you may become a priestly people and a holy nation. The reign of God is at hand. Let us proclaim the good news in word and deed. There are nameless ones who long to be followers of Jesus, who need someone to show them the ways of the Lord. Will you open your hearts and minds to greet that need? The reign of God is near. Let us reflect the good news in word and deed. Let us turn together in singing hymn number 467, Fill the World with Love. It's in the red hymnals. <laughs> Thank you. 
some here today that are traveling in multiple places. So I welcome them to come up. And dads are welcome too, or you can stay where you are, dads. But we have a special gift for every person who is like a father here in our midst. Hi, Dad. How are you doing, Dad? Rob? Good. Hi, Jojo. How are you? So this is a gift that from you guys to the dads in our church. And I want to explain what's in here. Tell me, Jojo, what is that? it up if it, it looks familiar to you, okay? Have you ever gotten a boo-boo, you know, something that really hurt, and mom or dad said, hmm, I think we can put something on it to help. It's a band-aid, isn't it? Yes! And what do band-aids do? They help you feel better, don't they? Yes. That's exactly what fathers do for us. They help us feel better. Yes, and some, whether it's just putting a band-aid on, or sometimes it's a big hug, or a kiss on the boo-boo, or a word of encouragement, telling you can do it. Yay, Jojo, you can do it. So that's what dads do, huh? Yes. And then there's something else in here, and Herb Morrison will tell you what he thought it was, but I'm not announcing that right now, but Herb has his own <laughs> idea of what this is. This is a, what's called an antacid. And you can eat this, and if you have a tummy ache, it makes the tummy ache go away. And it's, what's the flavor, Michaela? Coconut pineapple. Coconut pineapple. I've never heard of a coconut pineapple <laughs> antacid. But it hopefully tastes good. And do you know, the reason I put this in for you guys to give the dads is because heartburn is what Jesus had for all the people he loved. His heart burned for all the people that were in pain. And dads are like that. Sometimes dads really hurt when you hurt. When, have you ever heard that before? When you're crying, uh, my mom and dad used to tell me, when you cry, I cry inside too. I feel sad. Sometimes dads and moms feel sad when we're sad. And so this is kind of a funny little thing, just to remind us that dads always hurt when we hurt. So this is to help the heart burn, okay? Mm -hmm. And then there's a couple tiny, 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 oh, I wonder what these are, tiny things in here. They're so tiny, you might miss them. I can't even pick one up. Here we go, there they are. Little tiny, do you know what those are? You know what those are? Do you know that those came from your grandma? Yeah, they came from Grandma Heidi. Gave us those. Grandma Heidi knows the importance of seeds. Seeds are very important. What do we do with seeds? We plant the seeds, don't we? And what happens after we plant them? Does anything happen after we put them in the ground? What do we do? What happens to the seeds? or vegetables. This will grow spinach. You, do you like spinach? No. <laughs> Don't tell Grandma Heidi that. <laughs> well, maybe the dads in this place might like spinach, and so it would grow some spinach for us. And so seeds are very important, and sometimes our dads plant seeds in our life, like a good lesson that we have to learn is like a seed, it grows inside of us. Like maybe we learn that we shouldn't hit people. Does dad ever tell us that? That we shouldn't hit people or kick people? Sometimes we sh we're told not to do that. That's like a lesson that we learn. It's like a seed that's planted inside us to grow and helps us be strong people. So these are all little things to remind dads that God has a very special plan for them. So Dad Rob, you are reminded that God has gifted you with a wonderful responsibility as you raise Zeke.
And you have a whole community here who is cheering you on as a dad. That's good. <laughs> and we are here to applaud your efforts and to stand with you when it's rough and to celebrate with you when it's good. So you are not alone. None of you are alone. So what can we thank God for today? What do you think we can thank God for? Band-Aids. I like that. We'll thank God for Band-Aids. Okay, we'll thank God for Band-Aids. What else can we thank God for? Okay, crayons that don't hurt us. Let's thank God for the crayons that won't hurt us if, if, if uh, the kids decide to eat them. And how about dads? Can we thank God for dads? Okay. Can you show me, Jojo, how we pray in this place? Okay. Bow your head. Repeat after me, okay? Thank you, God. Thank you, God. For dads. For dads. For band-aids. For band-aids. And crayons that don't hurt us. In Jesus' name, name. amen.
prayers for Barbara L. as she goes, uh, having increasing health difficulties and having to make that difficult decision whether she can continue to live alone. Are there others that we can be in prayer for? Uh, yes, son. I have two joys. We three weeks ago we prayed for Dr. Dean, Father Love, Mr. So, nine years old. He was a operation is successful. He's a now. He's very well. Oh, what the, my friend the, the bear and the cat was the uh, she oh, came from the seven years ago, I think, so she finished it. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. We're glad to have you friends. Thank you. Yes. Kathleen? The joy, the joy is uh, thanks to everyone for your prayers for my daughter so that she would have to wait a month to get back to the But she's had it, and it seems to be
The scripture this morning is from Matthew 9, 35 through 38, and 10, 5b through verse 8. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no time town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. Alice. So last year, a few of us gathered in a Bible study and wrestled with some of the most difficult words of Jesus, as guided by biblical scholar Amy Jill Levine's book of the same name. It was no wonder that this text made her top six of the verses. She wrote her doctoral dissertation on the verse, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You see, Jesus is giving instructions to his freshly chosen disciples on how to be missionaries. Therefore, she chose the title of her dissertation to be Matthew and the Missionary Position. But the faculty nixed that title for its unintended sexual overtones. <laughs> but they did agree that the topic was significant, because why would Jesus tell his disciples not to bring their healings to the Gentiles? Why not engage with the Samaritans? And who exactly are those lost sheep? Our friend Bruce Epperly reminds us that this initial exclusion of the Samaritans and Gentiles is probably not encouraging racism or xenophobia, considering all the other actions and words that Jesus speaks in the gospel and does. But it may simply be an encouragement to begin where we are. The message of the gospel will eventually go global, but it has to start with people who will be initially most receptive and to whom the first followers of Jesus can share their message. Those first 12 disciples already had friends, relationships with other Jews, and if Jesus taught us anything, it is through relationship change occurs. Start then where, with getting to know our neighbors, uh, finding common ground in order to show God's message of creative transformation and healing. Build a bridge which will start in your own front yard and move forward from there. That's what Jesus is saying. It's true that Jesus does make it look rather easy when you read the Gospels. He went to all the synagogues preaching and teaching and curing the, speak, the sick and speaking of the realm of God being very near. But most importantly, Jesus had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. I would, I would state that if there were just one all-encompassing word to describe all of Jesus' actions on earth, you could make an argument that that one word would be compassion. The Greek word is esplankniste, esplankniste, which is only used in the New Testament in connection with God and Christ. 
It connotates a twisting pain in the gut, as writhing intense emotion like the worst of heartburn, for which antacid is helpful. This is the kind of word the Greeks are giving us. Jesus' heart burned for the people around him who were suffering. The Greek translated this word from the Hebrew word, which is riham, which means womb, W-O-M-B, womb, and points to the pains of a woman undergoing the agony of childbirth. A woman in labor. That's how Jesus felt when he saw the crowds around him. Total strangers, yet he knew them so very intimately. And he didn't blame them for their problems. He didn't pity them for their colorless, futile existence as oppressed people in the Roman Empire. He understood, as the word said, that they were harassed and they were helpless. Another Greek lesson for you, because I know that's why you came today to learn Greek, right? <laughs> Is that the word helpless literally means cast down to the ground. Jesus experienced intense agony over those who were being cast down to the ground all around him and set his sights on changing their circumstances, no matter the risk to himself. In viewing so, Jesus showed what it means to proclaim to the world the realm of God is near. And Jesus' teachings, that we heard in the text Ellis wrote about, read about a plentiful harvest and few laborers to bring about God's realm, would have spoken volumes to his audience. First century Galilee and Judea were filled with farmers who once owned and profited from their own harvest, but now found themselves nothing more than indentured slaves. The culture, you see, was brimming and boiling over with the spirit of revolution as the poor were becoming more and more exploited. The laboring class was becoming more oppressed by the wealthy and the Romans exercised horrific political authority over the Jews. The Roman-Jewish War of 66 to 69's Common Era was evidence of the political pot that was just boiling over and its eruption ended in the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. Jesus' words, therefore, were trying to avoid this failed revolution and the Roman backlash that would result. Just like Rabbi Hillel before Jesus, he was advocating a nonviolent revolution which would restore and transform justice for the people rather than a divisive and violent revolution which would tear the nation to pieces. Because compassion was all about, because Jesus was all about compassion, this revolution would involve things like resource sharing, like mutual aid, like reparation as a response to past injustices, nonviolent confrontation and change, and justice for those being oppressed. It was rooted in the wealthy being willing to forgive and cancel debts, and the poor laboring class being willing to join with the wealthy to care for the sick and share food with one another. In short, if embraced, this Jesus revolution that he advocated for, if embraced, it was a way of ordering society that would have completely changed Jewish culture, as well as threaten the Roman way of life to its core but it would have answered the needs of the harassed and the helpless, those who are feeling lost in a crumbling world without a shepherd to lead the way. It would have welcomed God's realm as a reality in their time and place. It would have been a kinship, a kingdom of God without the letter G, right before their very eyes. Some of you know history enough to know that the reason Jesus used the word kingdom of God because kingdom was familiar to them. That was the government of the day they lived in. But it's no longer relevant for you and I who live in a democratic republic. A more appropriate word to describe what Jesus is proclaiming now is kingdom, K-I-N-D-O-M of God. 
Yet, ironically, the word kingdom doesn't meet the standards of our society. This is not just because every time you type it in your word processing program, it gets underlined with red lines. Do you not mean kingdom? But it's also because we have glorified individualism, separatism, and that the idea of I and me is far more important than we and us. Kingdom is a strange word in our vocabulary because we are far more familiar with words like Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, whose culture can sometimes depress us with the rancor of political ideologies, with bragging and provocation, with those nonstop ads. And we have redefined phrases in our culture like no one is above the law. We have changed phrases like unity of nation to mean unity of the party of which I am a part of. We have reversed the meanings given by our four parents of the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. So on this Father's Day, I am struck particularly by how many fathers still live under the impression that compassion has no place in being a man. It does not describe a good father. Compassion and manliness are on opposite spectrums. So is it any surprise that the word kingdom as a description for humanity being related to one another is completely foreign to us? The kingdom of God, ironically, is the theme for the Disciples of Christ National 2023 General Assembly being held in Louisville this year. This theme is an attempt to bring us back to that vision of Jesus's, to the forefront of Christ's followers. For those sheep without a shepherd, harassed and helpless, there is good news for us. Because it is seeping into our psyche as more and more people are proclaiming this revolutionary message. Kinship is becoming more accepted here and beyond as we move from isolation back into our communities and neighborhoods. As we seek to not just address the needs of those whom we have a lot in common with, but those whom we do not. Those first followers of Jesus were given some pretty hard tasks, well beyond their and our abilities. But when we, you and I, reach out in compassion, we can expect, expect to claim our place as God's healers, teachers, guides, and justice makers. For God will give you the wisdom and the energy to do great things. We are not alone, dear friends. We aren't without resources. And I'm not just talking about band-aids and antacids. The whole energy of the universe is behind us. The moral and spiritual arc which God makes possible will support us in Jesus' revolution, this kingdom of God. So will you, dear friends? I confess this day that my daughters give me great hope for the future, their generation to come, the generations to come. So I have thought it appropriate to allow Michaela to share with you thoughts on this revolution from the millennial perspective, a perspective often not heard in traditional churches as this generation has found other places in which to share their visions. You may not agree with the vision, but it is out there. And it is speaking to the masses. And they are making their mark on the building of the kingdom of God. I sit. I watch. I wait. Do people not get it? People are shot in the streets. Rights are taken away. Children starve and parents cry. They cry for the world they leave their children. A world that doesn't get it. A country that refuses to see it. 
People think it's just white or black, man or woman, but it's so much more than that. It's a country that's forgotten its purpose, its people. Land of the free, freedom for all. More like freedom for none, except for the white, male, and straight. But you're none of these, then no one cares. You will be forgotten. You will work till the day you die and no one will mind. Oh, but lucky if you are born white. Even luckier if you're born male. The world is your oyster, or so they say. Just remember to stay in your lane. Don't cause a commotion. Don't fight for your rights. Stay complacent. Then you'll be all right. That's what they want, for you to follow blindly. Never ask questions. Don't be different. But you can't hide your different. You're not white, not male, not straight. Oh, well. Sorry, this country is closed to you. Maybe you'll find compassion somewhere else, but it won't be here. You don't have the money or the power, and you can't change that. You never will. Says who? Oh, right. The ones with the money. The ones with the power. The ones who really rule it all. The ones that decide who eat and who starve, who's educated and who's not. They decide who you love and who you hate. They decide. A 12-year-old should be a mother. A child having a child. The cousin's the father, not that it matters. No one cares how it happened, only that it happened. Guns have more rights than girls, right? They decide it all. So, what are you going to do? Are you going to sit and watch them continue to take? Bleed us dry until there's nothing left? I won't. I won't sit, I won't watch, and most of all, I won't wait. I will fight. I will fight for the rights we all deserve. Freedom to be who you are. Freedom to walk down the streets free of fear. Freedom to send your children to school knowing they will come home. Freedom to achieve the American dream. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The dream we were all promised. The dream we must fight for. But will you fight or will you sit, watch, wait? It's your call, but be quick. You might lose your chance. Shocking, disturbing, squirming in our seats. So were the people of Jesus' day as they listened to this revolutionary. What is Jesus asking you this day? Will you sit, watch, and wait? Or will you stand together in the revolution that is spreading the good news of compassion here and now? May the kingdom of God be known in our time and place by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, we are invited every Sunday to gather around a table which welcomes all people, which says that you are loved and you are good and you have a chair at this table, no matter who you are. We uh, invite you as we prepare to eat and drink here to stand and sing number 485, Diverse in Culture, Nation, Race. Stand if you're able to sing together.
Usually at this time during the service, we talk about receiving an offering. And I always feel bad when we do that. Because it makes us think about money. And money and power is the driving force in our society today. And I don't think there's anybody in this congregation that has much of a voice as far as money is concerned. We just simply can't afford to buy the politicians like the billionaires. This offering is more than money. It's about our lives. When I first started going to Sunday school, I was taught that God speaks to us through the Bible. And that's the only way we can hear the voice of God. Well, after 95 years, I've changed my mind. I am convinced that God speaks to every person in the world. Now, we don't always hear the voice of God. We don't always like the voice of God. We don't always do what God says. When I was reading a book uh, by Mark Lee, humor is no laughing matter. And I think it fits all of us. A man fell from the edge of a precipice, but checked his fall by grabbing the branch of a scrub oak growing from the side of the canyon. He could not make his way back. Dangling in space, he shouted in desperate prayer, Help! Is there anyone up there? From the sky came a majestic voice. Yes, I am here. Do you trust me, my son? I do, I do, cried the man. I trust you, Lord. Save me. Let go of the branch, my son, if you trust me. I trust you. I trust you. Let go of the branch. A silence followed. Then the man spoke again. Is there someone else up there I could talk to?
eternal God, we pray that you will help us dedicate our lives to you and to your service. Help us to see beyond our own personal prejudice, to see the needs of the world around us. May your spirit descend upon each of us that we might truly serve you through Jesus Christ our Lord. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We all come from different backgrounds, and we've had different experiences in relationship to the uh, communion, or the Lord's Supper, or the Eucharist or whatever it may have been called where we used to go to church. But as we receive this bread and this cup, it reminds us that life comes from God. And God has given each one of us a life that we can live as we choose. And as we receive the bread and the cup, it is a reminder that we are God's people and that we need to always be aware of the many gifts that God has given to us. The blessings are ours, but they are ours to share with each other. And Jenna talked about this chalice that was in memory of her father. Glenn and I went to graduate school together at Drake University, and we became very close friends. And following graduation, we went to the state of Montana, and we had the only, we were in the only county in the state of Montana that had two Christian churches. We became very close friends, and we visited with each other constantly as we share together in ministry. And that's what ministry is all about for each of us. And this bread and this cup reminds us that we have something to share with each other. The great gift of God, of life, of forgiveness, of compassion. Shall we pray? Eternal God, as we receive this bread and this cup, help us to accept these gifts with deep appreciation. And may, may we also dedicate ourselves to your service. Help us to be responsible not only to you, but to each other that your spirit may be proclaimed throughout the world, that your gift of life and hope might reach everyone. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
leaders who are compassion. We invite you to come forward as we sing number 480. We'll do verses 1 and 3. Stand if you're able to sing together. <laughs>